And good afternoon and welcome. This is What's Up Noop one-on-one conversation series. My name is Ryan Bellamore and joining me is our news editor, Mr. Frank Prosnitz is here. And it's good afternoon, Frank. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing okay. And uh, Mr. Stokes is joining us today. So we're going to join him right in and get to the conversation. How are you doing there, Keith? Great. Good to see you, Ryan. Hi, Frank. Hi, Keith. How are you? Good. Uh, these are uh, uh, these are challenging times, if we will, or maybe things actually, uh, after many years, are finally going to uh, move to a point where we can get some things done. There's so many things that you have done, Keith, that have been uh, that have been beneficial to the community as a whole, to uh, the African American community, uh, to the Jewish community. I can go on and on and on. Uh, I wanted to focus clearly, if we can, or we wanted to focus clearly, if you can. The efforts that you've been making in in our educational community, to me, it all begins with education. If we can get that down and get it done right, then perhaps we can uh, uh, get a little bit better uh, better future for all of us. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, it it's certainly interesting times. I mean, I really believe we're in a new civil rights era, um, and I think it's something that's going to move the needle forward positively for for all Rhode Island citizens and American citizens. So tell me about or tell us about the efforts that you're making relative to the State House and uh, and elsewhere about helping to develop a curriculum uh, for, for black kids. Well, let me start, let me backtrack a moment. What are we doing wrong? What are we not teaching now in, in our schools that we need to be teaching? Well, let, let me start off with a premise. Um, and I think it's very much related to the times that we're currently in. Um, from my perspective, I think a challenge facing people of color in Newport, Rhode Island, across the country, it's not only overt racism, it's really invisibility. And far too many of American history, it's taught, it's interpreted, it's memorialized through a majority viewpoint. And what we're actually seeing today across the country and even here in Rhode Island is that you know Confederate memorials, um, statues that celebrate and represent those who represent racial, ethnic, religious oppression. That's not the history that America is gonna to tolerate anymore. Um, and you're seeing that very much each and every day with people looking to take down statues that represent um, certainly Confederate memorials. They're certainly dismantling statues of anyone and everyone related to issues of slavery and slave trade. And I think what we're seeing is, is very much a focus less on what we take down and deconstruct, but rather, you know, why are we not recognized? And I think there's a great leadership across the country that is looking to reclaim public spaces, memorials, and most importantly, education that's inclusive and represents all the people. Um, and I think right here in Newport, we've got the opportunity to lead the nation and how we tell a more inclusive history and how we present an inclusive uh, space that recognizes public memorials, public spaces, statues that represent everyone. But I think the challenge is, is getting to that next step. Uh, right now, it's very emotional. Um, people are moving very quickly uh, to dismantle what they feel does not represent them uh, or what offends them. And my concern with that is, is that any decisions to change history or to revise history or even to interpret history, it has to, be, it has to begin with very thoughtful uh, and very strong consensus validated understanding of the history that they would like to revise or interpret. Um, so I think we need to take a step back a bit and understand more clearly and honestly and openly the history in Rhode Island uh, works and all. And that's one of the reasons why I've been involved with a number of historic institutions, the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, Rhode Island Historical Society, the State Historic Preservation Commission and others who have worked diligently over the last several years to begin building and designing units of instruction for African and African heritage history in Rhode Island. Uh, in fact, we're pretty far down the road. We actually have lesson plans, units of instruction in place. Um, people may not recognize it, but right here in Rhode Island, we have some of the deepest primary secondary sources of African-American history, documents, heirlooms, artifacts, as compared to anywhere in the country. The challenge is, is most people don't have access to it and they're certainly not seeing it in the classroom. So I think we have an opportunity to tell the story of Rhode Island that's more inclusive, uh, and that recognizes the contribution of all Rhode Islanders, past, present, and future. And I've been working very diligently to begin that process by establishing African-American history in K-12 to public schools, because I think that's the starting point. Once we get people to have a, a historical connection to who we were, 
and who we are today. But I think it's easy for us to make some of the difficult decisions that we're seeing today and how we best represent either our history through statues, memorials, or public spaces. Are you finding any resistance to be, to be able to develop that program or to put a program in place? I, I don't think the issue is resistance. I think it's priorities. Um, I think on one hand, uh, education, and particularly historical education, may not have been the type of priority that people have embraced. Um, again, today, in the times that we live, with the significant references to the history of oppression, the history of slavery uh, going on across the country, uh, the issues that we're seeing today with the Black Lives Matter movement, there's clearly an interest level today that I had not seen in previous years. Um, so I don't see it as roadblocks. I don't see it as resistance. I see it's just a lack of knowledge. And I do believe today that particularly the young people who are leading these campaigns, um, they're looking for a city, a state, a country that's more representative of their, of their experiences and who they are. I mean, let, let's be clear, from a demographic aspect, by 2050, the majority of the people in this country will be people of color. I mean, that is a demographic certainty. So the majority of voters, visitors, customers, school children, you name it, are gonna look less like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and more like George Floyd. And I think we need to prepare education systems, business systems, communication systems that meet this new population demand. You know, I think, and I wanna come back to the education in a, in a moment, but I think about um, uh, the memorials, the statues, and I think about uh, kids walking through and, and not seeing anybody who's representative of them, um, is there an effort? And I know that you've made an effort in Newport to try and establish a place where in fact, there may be those kind of recognitions. And you've met with some resistance with that. Well, my, my general sense is that I've, I've talked about having more inclusive memorials and statues in Newport years ago um, and suggested that particularly the lack of African-American, but, um, Quite candidly, three, four years ago, that may not have been the sense of urgency that you're seeing today. I mean, today, um, everyone or most people want to be associated with being progressive or anti-racist. That's a new term that I just learned a few weeks ago. Uh, but in any case, um, it really doesn't matter uh, what happened two or three years ago. It matters what's happening today and going forward. And if there is a earnest interest in having more of an inclusive representation of our memorials in Newport, and that includes more women, people of color, uh, natives. Um, I think that's a good thing. I mean, quite candidly, the, the most recent debate that I'm hearing with the Christopher Columbus statue on Memorial Boulevard, I don't believe the issue is having Christopher Columbus statue on Memorial Boulevard. I think the issue is, is the lack of representation of other important contributors to the history of Newport and Rhode Island in America that is lacking. Um, we have in Newport no memorials or statues recognizing significant contributors within the African-American community to all aspects of Newport. And that's missing. Uh, Latino, the fastest growing population in Newport, that representation. Uh, the native people, uh, my Antinomi, Canonicus, I can go on through the list. I mean, the, there are so many people in history that have had a direct hand in shaping who we are today, but they're completely invisible in the landscape. So as I said very early on, the challenge isn't just overt racism, the challenge is invisibility. And I, and I can tell you, young people who are demanding that these statues be taken down or changed, they're making it loud and clear, we want representation, we want visibility, we want to be recognized. Our stories, our culture, our language, our history wants to be recognized also. And the only way we can get your attention is taking down what you have. And they certainly have gotten our attention. Uh, do you think that um, it's appropriate to take down the statues of uh, Civil War, uh, Southern Civil War heroes? Um, or, uh, or ought they be placed somewhere and in a museum with, a, with their whole story to be read next to them? Well, again, uh, my personal opinion is Confederate statues should come down because they were traitors to the United States of America. They were traitors to an American flag. Um, they initiated a civil war that killed over 600,000 Americans. So I see no value, no reason for Confederate statues uh, to stand anywhere in America. If they want to be interpreted through another context, through an historical society or private institution, so be it. But I do not believe they should be occupying a public space. Uh, I mean, with that said, taking down a Confederate statue is a very different 
process than identifying statues or buildings or historic sites that might be attributed to other aspects of a negative history of our country. We need, that's a very slippery slope we need to be very careful of. As an example, I, I do as much work as anyone in the issue of the transatlantic slave trade in our community, in our state, in our nation. And I'm hearing rumblings of, well, there are buildings associated. There are certain street names associated. Well, at the end of the day, where do you end? Where do you begin? Who makes these decisions? Who arbitrates the decisions of what history should be? That's a very slippery, dangerous slope that I'd be very careful with. I ascribe to rather than deconstructing history, we should construct history. And that means being more inclusive and more open and more honest and having our citizens have access to all the factual information that comprise the city and the state. Uh, that's a lot of heavy lifting. It takes more time and effort. Uh, but again, uh, once you take something down uh, and remove something, it's gone. And, and I'm just very concerned about these rash decisions that do not include thoughtful dis discussions. Most importantly, comprehensive knowledge of the entire history that's tied to either that place or that statue or that event or that person. Um, and to be candid, quite frankly, people are pulling more information about the history from Wikipedia and the internet than going to the Newport Historical Society, Rhode Island Historical Society and other institutions that have the factual content and information to share. And Keith, knowledge is certainly power. And, uh, you know, if we started teaching this um, in elementary school and grade school and middle school and high school, um, it would certainly make our entire community better. You know, what is what is the one thing that all of us can do to support the effort to make it more of an inclusive history class in our local schools? Well, the good news is, is that several years ago, the Rhode Island legislature and the governor initiated a process to establish what became the 1696 Heritage Commission. This commission was led by our Secretary of State and was comprised with scholars and educators who designed and developed a comprehensive education platform in African-American history. So the, so the heavy lifting is done. That's the great news. The next critical step is the Rhode Island General Assembly with support of the governor needs to simply put in legislation that authorizes the Rhode Island Department of Education to incorporate African-American history within K-12 public schools. Now let's, let's be clear and keep our eyes wide open. We've all barely have come through the disruptions of the COVID virus. It has had significant negative impacts to municipal budgets and private company operations. So I would suggest, and I think it's a simple opportunity, we wouldn't implement this for one or two years. Give it time for the budget to come back, give it time to spend the time to organize, recruit and prepare the lesson plans. But I think it's absolutely essential that today we send the message that history, history that's inclusive of all Rhode Islanders needs to be incorporated in our K-12 public schools. So we're there, we're very close. We're simply looking for the leadership of our elected officials. Uh, we know what we don't like, we know what we wanna take down, but here's an opportunity to build something and make it sustainable that'll benefit all Rhode Islanders for years to come. Um, I will tell you, no, I just wanna point out that the Providence City Council, to their credit, last week, they did pass a resolution adopting and supporting K-12 African-American history included in Rhode Island schools. They've sent that resolution to the governor, to legislative leaders, and I believe they're sending the resolutions to other cities and towns. It would be great here in a clinic island to have Newport, Portsmouth, and Middletown join in in supporting this effort. Um, are you looking for this to become um, mandatory education uh, from K through 12, mandatory program? It has to be incorporated within public education. I wouldn't go to say that has to be mandated. I think it has to be incorporated within the flexibility of the school system and the state education guide plan. So it could be a part of a social studies program. It could be a part of an advanced studies program. It could be a part of an experiential learning experience. There's a number of ways that you can provide access to education and fulfillment to students. But I think what's most important is, is that we have to start with the premise that African-American history has a value and you really don't and you can't understand what island history without knowing that that aspect of it and it's again i just want to be clear it's not slavery slavery is not black history african heritage ancestors who survived and thrived despite slavery that's black history and there are so many elements that we could be presenting and talking about not only during the colonial period but during the gilded age and into the 20th century where African heritage men, women, and families contributed greatly 
uh, to our city and to our community and our state. Do we have enough um, minority educators in the state to um, to help promote the program, to help um, champion the program? Again, my, my goal, this is not tied to being, you know, black people don't have to teach black history, white people don't have to teach white history, and on and on and on. Uh, good quality educators are good quality educators. A key aspect of this legislation is to provide professional teacher development and training. It is absolutely essential that we ensure that our educators in our K-12 schools, particularly those within social studies and histories, have access to the tools and the training so they are best equipped to, in, to literally to teach this history and integrate this history into the larger curriculum. So it's not about who the teacher is. We've got great teachers in our school system. We just need to give them the tools and resources to teach. So I guess my question should be should have been a little a little different. Do we have a sufficient number of minorities teaching within our schools to uh, to serve as role models for not only uh, for not only uh, uh, students of color, but for other students to realize that, in fact, those people who achieve teaching positions can be from any race? Well, that, that's a separate issue, Frank. I mean, again, you certainly want a any any public institution, any private business should have staff and employees that represent their constituents or their market or their customers. That's just good business, that's just sensible. So it's clearly, if you're having a fast growing student population of color, you certainly want to have teachers and administrators and educators that reflect that population. But I wanna disconnect that from establishing and then having a successful operating African-American history program. What we need is good scholars, good scholarship and professional training so that our teachers can deploy that, that particular part of the studies. Do we want to encourage more people of color to be teachers? Yes, but I'd also like to see more people of color and women in the corporate and C-level jobs and corporations and businesses. I'd like to see more people of color sitting on town councils, but that's an issue that's going to come sooner than later because I go back to my demographic statement. In the next 30 years, the majority of the population in this country will be people of color and they will then be soon moving into positions of leadership in decision-making. Those are cycles that we've seen since the very beginning of our country. And now we're going through yet another demographic cycle. So it's going to happen sooner versus later. It's those institutions and those companies that embrace diversity, that embrace inclusion, not because it's a good social thing to do, because it just makes good business sense. So where are we in the legislature now? You said that the the General Assembly has been pretty much in favor of this, but we need leadership to move this forward. Um, what are we hearing from the leadership of the General Assembly? Well, I've had conversations with members of the Black Latino Caucus, other local legislators, they're all interested. And, and I think the goal would be is, is that when they come back in formal session in January to introduce uh, legislation that authorizes the inclusion of African-American history in K-12 schools. Uh, my sense is that there'll be support around that. Um, but what I'd like to do is to build broad-based public interest in support around this. Thus, the Providence City Council, other city councils, civic organizations, all standing behind this effort. It has to be something that we all buy into and that we all see value in. This cannot be seen as simply a response to Black Lives Matter movement. It has to be seen as something that every student from K to 12, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation, will benefit from. And that's what makes it sustainable, Frank. And I think our goal here is to make something that's sustainable and value. Keith, has this been attempted before? Not to this level, uh, not at all to this level. And, and again, let's be, let's be candid and clear. Um, not many people were talking about African-American history. Not many people were talking about African-American business. Not many people were talking about African-American much of anything until the last several months. Uh, and over the last several months, because of the tragedy of George Floyd, uh, the ongoing tragedies that we're seeing in violence um, within the African-American and other communities of color, I think people are now coming forward and we're seeing these protests, not only across the country, but across the world. We are literally within a new civil rights era. And we have to take advantage of this and build a platform of change based upon real tangible opportunities. African-American history curriculum is a real tangible opportunity. Having statues and memorials that represent an inclusive Newport and Rhode Island in America is real. But I, I just wanna be candid. The easiest thing for us to do 
is take things down. The easiest thing for us to do is remove a name. The easiest thing for us to do uh, is to shame and point out who are the bad guys in history. And once that's done, what's the next step? How do we rebuild our education system? How do we rebuild our communities? How do we ensure that every citizen, regardless of their racial, ethnic, and religious background, has true representation in recognition within the city of Newport or the state around in America? And education, as you said, both of you in the beginning, is the key. Well, it, it is critical. And I, I think about that, uh, uh, any young kid who's in there and they, and they want to have pride in their community, they do it through the educational system that provides them with that kind of history. And they, they provide them with, the, they, they get it through the memorials they're able to visit in which they um, see and, and, uh, uh, and hear people who are like them, who have achieved. It, it really is important, uh, you know, and Ryan and Frank, I'll tell you, I, my concern right now is, is that I'm, I'm seeing lots of what I've termed cosmetic activists. Um, they jump right up and they're the first ones to tear down a Robert E. Lee statue and the first ones to uh, take down a rebel flag. And then they kind of walk away saying, it's done. Racism is cured. The bad guy has been identified. Let's move on. Uh, that is a real danger that we're facing right now in this critical time in society. We need to build sustainable programs that ensure that our city, our state, and our nation is fully inclusive to all citizens. And that's more than taking a statue down. That's more than removing a flag. So I share that concern, but from a, a different angle, when you refer to these cosmetic um, activists who once they pull that statue down, think their work is done, uh, when that work has to, is just beginning, uh, it gets heard at the voting booth in November it gets heard when when uh, when these young people stand up and say, "I'm going to run for office, and I'm going to I'm going to push my agenda um, uh, through through elective office." Uh, and I think that's important. I don't know if uh, many of those people have stepped forward uh, to run white, black, and otherwise um, who have a different story to tell. And I am uh, I'm concerned that they they will not make their voices be heard at the voting booth in in the fall. I agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, how do we do that? How do we motivate them? Who, whose job is it to motivate them? Well, I, I, I don't know if it's any one person's job per se. I, I, I think what we, we should be doing is, is engaging as many interested parties and giving them access to education. If it's the history of Rhode Island, they need to have access to our historical societies and institutions. Um, if there's a political interest, we need to have grassroots reach out into communities to get more people engaged in all levels of government. It could be running for council, a school committee, or state legislature, or it could be sitting on a planning board. Um, but it starts with a very concerted outreach effort so that we're reaching out across the board and touching on parties and families and communities across the state. And, and I think that's happening. Here in Newport, I think we've got 20 people running for the city council. I can't recall that number of people running for council in recent history. I mean, when I sat on the council in the 80s and 90s, if you got four or five people running, that was a competitive race. So I think by the very nature that so many people are stepping forward and wanting to participate in public service, that's a positive, and we should encourage that and embrace that. Do you see a lot of people? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. A lot of people are uh, engaged and interested right now. How? What would you give people as a recommendation of how to be the best activist they can be to support the cause? You know, everyone, sh we all have opinions on that. And I think what's most important is, is just people to reach out, um, talk to a variety of constituents, um, talk to institutions, uh, and really make sure that the information that you have access to uh, is valid and tested. Um, it's just that sometimes we're all in a very highly charged emotional state and we want to go out there and make a difference tomorrow. And, and sometimes we take rash actions. Um, I think this is a time for thoughtful dialogue and opportunities to share concerns and interests. Uh, the one great thing about Newport and Rhode Island is we're so small, we could get people together pretty quickly and, and share these divergent viewpoints. But my concern right now is, is, is the rash actions. Um, and I'm also very concerned that we're getting a lot of our information from the internet. It's, it's not to say the internet is a problem of in itself, but sometimes the fact checking and the quality of the information 
may not be as consistent uh, as we'd like it to be. And again, being here in Newport, if it's a history question, if, if you want to talk about the history of slavery and slave trade, the Newport Historical Society is an outstanding institution and has access to records and materials that they're willing to share and work with organizations. Um, I'm a part of the Round Black Harry Society. They're the oldest in the country. They have access to artifacts, records, and documents to share. So, so the good news is it's out there. If people would just step back and take the time to listen, to learn, and then reach out across across the aisle. One of the things that I think has been misunderstood, and actually I heard it yesterday in an interview that we did, when people talk about defunding the police, um, and I think that uh, many people think that means literally defunding and eliminating the police. What's what's your interpretation of, of that, and is it really a misnomer? Well, everything I've read and understood uh, the goal was not, and I'm sure some might want to defund police, but we need law enforcement uh, and we all value it. Uh, I think the goal was to begin to rethink how we deploy law enforcement at the community level and what do we need to do in funding those aspects that enhance community-based policing and allow public participation in shaping law enforcement policies. That's what's being discussed. Unfortunately, and again, this is a great example of just rash discussions. There's so much emotionalism out there. There's so much concern that both sides are digging in. I mean, as I'm hearing some activists say, dismantle every aspect of law enforcement, but I'm also hearing from some of the police unions saying, don't touch us. Um, we don't want to talk about it. We're set in our way. So there is room for compromise. There's room for negotiation, both at the federal and the state and municipal level. But I think the starting point is, is that we should all value having law enforcement in place. The next question is, what's the best way to deploy that system within our particular community and to meet the needs of our growing and diversifying population? There are examples. Camden, New Jersey is an example of how it works. There are many examples out there in best practices, and that's why that thoughtful deliberation discussion should lead the effort. I mean, here in Newport, my grandfather was one of the earliest African-American police officers, and we're talking about 1909. So there's a history here. Um, we need to understand that history, and we need to stand, also understand that Newport of 1909 is not Newport in 2020 uh, from a law enforcement pers perspective. But what we need to recognize is that the starting point is, is that having a good quality qualified police department is an asset to any community. The next step is, how do we empower that department so that they have access to the training and the support services and the equipment to do the best job that represents and protects the interest of all citizens within our community and our state or nation. And that just, it requires thoughtful, deliberate discussions and planning. And I'm old and I know that's boring and young people will say, get out of the way, Keith, your time's over. And that's fine. But at the end of the day, good policy should always trump bad politics, always. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Keith, what, what are the, you know, how long do you think it will take for us to put in place um, the academic program necessary to, to, uh, to teach black history from K through 12? Well, the good news is all the resources are in place. The issue is, is when will school departments and systems have the financial um, capability and capacity to, and that's why, again, my suggestion, the legislature will do ultimately what they feel is best suited, my suggestion is I would not implement it for at least uh, one to two years, just so that we can right size ourselves after the devastation of COVID and the disruptions within budgets. Um, but right now what we can do and we do quite well, the Rhode Island Historical Society, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, they've created an entire comprehensive website that has access to all different resources, documentation resources, artifact resources, all tied to black history. And it's set up in units of instruction. So you, if you have an interest in Africa before European colonization, you can go into that site and see all the resources and written materials about that. If you're interested in the colonial slave trade, you can do that. If you're interested in the Industrial Revolution and the advent of civil rights in Rhode Island, you can do that. So the great thing is the resources are all in place. The institutions have made available their collections and resources. So we can start today by having education sessions, teaching sessions, exhibits, programming, which could lead up to eventually within the next year or two, actual classroom experiences. So we're in a very good position here in Rhode Island. We just need people, look, I think it's easy for us to agree on what we don't like and what we wanna take down, 
but it's a challenge sometimes for us to agree on what we do agree on and what we do like and what we want to build upon. And African-American history curriculum, I believe, is one of those low-hanging fruit that everyone can agree upon, build upon, and make available in a very short period of time for all students in Rhode Island. Keith, if I and I would challenge. Out, go ahead, Ryan. Oh, go ahead, Frank. I was going to ask if I was going to take a look out at the legislative session coming up and all of the issues that are out there relative to this Black Lives uh, movement and other issues of of, uh, of race race and equality. What would I want to get out of the legislature this year? What kinds of initiatives? <laughs> I, it's an easy question. <laughs> I tell you, the great news is there's some good things going on. There's some, some good things going on in economic development, education, workforce training, um, obviously education, historical education. I think there's some, some good energy out there. And the discussions that I've had and I've been involved in, it seems very positive. Um, how that lays out into policy, into legislative initiative, that's why we have a general assembly. I mean, when they come together and convene, they'll sort those things out, set priorities, and decide what they want to fund or not. And again, the, the little piece that I might have that I've been pretty much uh, focused on is the education piece. Um, and I do believe this is low-hanging fruit, and it's an opportunity to do something that's sustainable and that could possibly touch every Rhode Island, and certainly every Rhode Island student in a very short period of time. And uh, we're talking a lot about uh, school age education, but uh, we're always a student. We should always be learning. Let's not uh, forget about uh, those that aren't in school, um, that they should be educating themselves on these history as well. Uh, what are some of the great resources? I know you've mentioned them a couple of times there, Keith, but maybe one more time for anybody who's listening of any age, because it's never too late to learn this history and uh, some of the tools and resources that are out there. No, and, and Ryan, uh, one of the positive things, if any, not many, coming out of the COVID disruptions has been the CARE Act. And the Rhode Island uh, Community for the Humanities, they received some CARE funds, and they've been deploying it to historical organizations and civic and arts organizations across the state for the sole purpose of helping them move their exhibits and lectures and programs and tours to a virtual online platform. So one of the things, and I'm working on a half dozen different projects around that. So one of the good things that I think people will begin to see by the end of the summer, by the end of the year into 2021, is that there will be greater access through virtual online platforms of collections, tours, visitor experiences, so that you physically don't have to be there or may not afford to be able to go to or be a part of a physical experience. So I think that's coming very soon. But right here in Newport, uh, the Newport Historical Society is a resource, you know, that's right at our fingertips and they've got an outstanding staff and they're connected and they're engaged and they are doing things on a virtual and online platform and I applaud them. The Rhode Island Historical Society is doing the same. The Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, uh, our Secretary of State at our state archives, if you want to read first person primary records about the colonial era, about the slave trade, they're there in the state archives and you can read them and have a firm and clear and valid understanding of what life was like and how that trade uh, existed at that time in early Rhode Island. So each and every one of those institutions are all, I mean, we're all working on a new normal. We know that we have to deploy and present and interpret history in a new way. And a lot of it's gonna be tied to electronic and social media platforms. And I think we're all preparing to do exactly that. And I think you'll start to see these things starting to unfold through the summer into the end of the year. Any other things, Keith, that you think are important that we ought to touch on uh, this afternoon? I, I think the most important thing is, is the demographics. I mean, in the next 30 years, the majority of the people in this country are going to have a very different customer service requirement, historical interpretation requirement, dining and hospitality requirement. It's all going to change. And any business uh, that wants to get ahead of the curve should recognize that. Any historical society that wants to continue to present programs and exhibits should get ahead of that curve. Uh, and any government system should recognize that the future voters, the future majority voters of this state, as I said before in jest, they're going to look less like George and Washington and Thomas Jefferson and more like George Floyd. And we need to prepare for that and have the systems and programs that meet the needs of this new population. And we're seeing it right here in Newport. I, I just want to end with this. It's just fascinating to me to see this. 
Um, a few years ago, I did a survey study for the state on the history of civil rights in Rhode Island. And in Newport, we did a survey of some of the communities where African-Americans had lived, and particularly African-Americans in the late 19th, early 20th century. And one of the communities that stood out is what today we call Top of the Hill. Uh, Newport has lots of names and neighborhoods, so I'm always trying to keep up. But Top of the Hill is basically the area from Bellevue Avenue, K Street, uh, running down to Memorial Boulevard, uh, and it backs into um, Old Beach Road to some, some aspect. So streets like Elizabeth Street, Fillmore Street, all those streets. Well, at the turn of the century, that was largely an African-American community. In fact, it had two African-American churches, one on Bellevue Avenue and one set back uh, off of K Street. And many African-Americans lived, worked, worshiped there. There were black owned businesses there. It was significantly an African-American community, top of the hill. Today, if you went through those neighborhoods, a lot of those large buildings, those apartment houses, um, you're now seeing Latino families and such living there. And in 2020, what are they doing? The same thing that African-American families were doing 100 years before. Um, they're working in the hospitality industry. They're saving money. They're building a life. Uh, they're supporting their children. And they're setting the stage for them to be the next generation of active citizens in this community. So these things happen in cycles. Um, history happens in cycles. And once you understand those cycles and what the history is, we could be better positioned today to provide the services and support to help the next generation of Newport citizens. And I'm very excited about that. And, and again, um, it is a troubling time. It's been a challenge of uh, horrific events with George Floyd and so many others. I think it's a wake up call for all of us, but I think we all have an obligation, not simply to just take things down. We now have an obligation to build a better society for all. And we can do that starting right in Newport. That's a great way to end. Keith, yeah, thank, thank you for you. joining us today. No, thank you. Anytime. I, I just really enjoy this and anything more I can do, please reach out. Well, you, you speak you speak a lot of good words and a lot of important things. And uh, hopefully a lot of people are listening. Uh, thank you much for uh, today and for what you do for the community. Great. Well, we hope we will do it again in a short period of time and have some real things, some real programs to talk about. Well, we, uh, we certainly will. All right, Keith Stokes, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Prosnitz, thank you for uh, organizing and bringing Mr. Stokes on with us today. Well, you're welcome. I've known Keith for a number of years. He's a quality individual and, as you can see, great ideas and uh, one of the great leaders in our community. He sure is. And that's going to do it for us on this edition. If you have somebody you think we should interview, email me at ryan at whatsupnoop.com. Interest in topics, conversations, people, everybody has a story, as Mr. Prosnitz said. So send them our way and we'd love to chat with them. How's that sound? Sounds good. Uh, I before we're on our yeah, well, before we leave, Frank, you have to explain your hat. Oh, this hat. So I'm I'm a uh, I'm a crazy Baltimore Orioles fan. So this is Orioles, uh, written phonetically in Hebrew. <laughs> you got to raise it up a little bit higher. Yeah, go. Oh, yeah, there we go. There you go. Now, for those of you who might be able to read it, it's it's uh, read from. Uh, see if I can put this correctly. Hey, uh, there we go. Uh, there from go. right to left, right? Yeah, whatever it is. There it is. Oh, I figured I'd ask because uh, somebody yeah. was going to tell me after Orioles saying, it is. So, you know, baseball season is maybe going to begin. That's <laughs> it. All right, Frank. Well, until the next time, uh, we will uh, talk to you later, my friend. Very good. Thank you. All right. That's going to do it for us on this edition. Again, email me, ryan at whatsupnoop.com, if you know somebody in the community that we should be interviewing. <laughs>